So I recently took the Certified Kubernetes Administrator exam. I did not know any Kubernetes when I began studying for this exam. I passed on the first try, and I want to share with you the tips, the tricks, some of the resources that I use to pass this exam on the first try, and what you might be able to expect when you sit down and take the exam yourself. So one of the skills we need in order to, before we can even jump into Kubernetes, is if you're new to the whole Kubernetes world, you need to know some Linux and some Bash. Now you don't need to be an expert in Linux, but you do need to know how to navigate the command line. I would say the skill level required for the Kubernetes exam is you need to be a beginner in Linux. You should be able to navigate the command line, move around directories and files. You should be able to edit files using Vim or VI. You should be able to move through a file, edit a file, replace lines, delete lines, and edit lines. And I would say you need to learn how to use system services. You need to know how to start a system service, how to find the status of a system service, and you need to know how to make sure that system service stays persistent across reboots. And I would say you also need to know how to look through logs, right? How to get to the var log directory, how to look at the logs. So you might get a better understanding of, of where to look for errors that might be occurring at the system level. Once you feel comfortable in the Linux command line, I would then say you want a beginner level understanding of containers, maybe install Docker uh, and play around with uh, persistent data when creating a container, writing commands when creating a container, exposing ports when creating a container. Important, I think you want to be able to list uh, current containers and running containers on a given machine. Me personally, I use Container D instead of Docker because Kubernetes is going to deprecate Docker or Container D in the future. So you probably see here in the example that I'm using, I'm using CRICTL instead of Docker. So I would say once you've got the Linux and the Bash and you feel comfortable moving around the command line, you know how to edit files, you maybe know how to troubleshoot a system a little bit. Once you feel like you know how containers work conceptually, um, I would say then you're ready to move into Kubernetes and learning Kubernetes. So the first thing I did was I did go to Google and I did type in how to learn Kubernetes and I did click on the Tech World with Nana course over here. And if you're not familiar with uh, with her courses, hey uh, everyone, this is Nana. Tim here. At um, I highly recommend you check out her YouTube page. Uh, she puts a lot of hard work in her videos. She's got a lot of good videos in the DevOps, uh, but she does have a Zero to Hero Docker course. So I watched this course. Uh, if I was driving to work, I would listen to this course. If I was on doing yard work, I was listening to this course, right? Just trying to wrap my head around the basic terminology of Kubernetes. What is a pod? What is a, what is a worker node versus a master node? What is a service? Um, all that's explained in this video in very good detail, and you can just listen to it. You don't have to watch it. So after I watched or listened to this video numerous times, probably two or three times, I wanted to, it was time to get my hands dirty. It was time to create a Kubernetes cluster. And I didn't really know how to do that. So I found out about this course called Kubernetes the Hard Way, hosted by a cloud guru. They teach you step by step how to build a Kubernetes cluster uh, the hardest way possible. So for those who don't know, you can build a Kubernetes cluster using system D services on Linux. You can use it. Um, you can do a, a mini cube, which is, is just a, it's a simple VM and a command you run. You can use cube ADM, which is more of a full cluster production type deal for free, um, but it runs on containers and it's not as complicated to set up. But Kubernetes is the hard way. While not necessary, it's going to teach you a lot about the inner workings of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so I highly recommend maybe at least take a look at it if you can afford uh, a Cloud Guru subscription. And I did do the $47 a month subscription um, because with that, right, um, they give me access to an AWS instances. So I can, you know, if I don't have hardware at home to create a Kubernetes cluster on or VMs, I can launch EC2 instances in AWS or the equivalent in Azure or GCP and create a cluster that way using those servers. So once I kind of understood, you know, how a Kubernetes cluster was supposed to be architectured, I did what any sane person would do, and I spent $600 on Raspberry Pis and a switch 
to build my own home lab. So deploying a cluster alone is not enough to pass the exam. You need to know how to create deployments, pods, services, deploy applications and containers, sidecar containers. You need to know all of this. How to, But what you also need to know how to do is troubleshoot when your cluster is not operating the way you expect, right? Maybe your kubelet service has stopped working. You need to be able to know how to troubleshoot and resolve issues like that. And what building a cluster does is it forces you to learn those mechanisms that control your cluster, your API server, etcd, kubelet, and it teaches you how where their configurations might be stored and how they operate so you can troubleshoot them in the event you run into a scenario like that on the exam because it is one of the objectives on the exam. So if you've never heard of Udemy, it's a great website to learn a lot of things. It's my go-to place when I'm trying to learn any new technology or IT certification. The courses are generally uh, about $30. Um, and in particular, for the Certified Kubernetes Administrator exam, there's, I'll put a link in the description, but this course right here by Moomshad um, is great. And what's so good about this course is once you once they go over a concept like multi-container pods here, there's always a practice test in which they take you to their website, codecloud.com. And normally you have to pay to enroll in this website, right? But if you uh, bought the course through Udemy, they give you a code so you can enroll for free. So you have all these labs that you can do, and they're so well. So you'll hit start lab, it'll, it'll create a cluster, they'll give you some tasks, and then at the end of you attempting to complete those tasks, um, they'll grade it for you. They'll tell you what you did. They'll tell you how to accomplish that task. Uh, and then you can kind of figure out what you did wrong. You can play around with it. And it's overall a really good learning resource. So if you go through this entire Code Cloud course and you do all of the practice tests, and at the end there are these three big practice tests. Uh, there are about 20 questions. You get about an hour and a half, two hours. Kind of simulate a real exam um, if you go through all of that you'll be pretty well set to take the real exam so one of the best resources out there for preparing and knowing if you're ready to take the certified kubernetes administrator exam is going to be the killer.sh killer.shell kubernetes exam simulator so if you look it up on google you'll get to this page and you'll see for ck exam environment um, you get 25 scenarios, 120 minutes, and a 36 hour cluster. So what happens is when you purchase this, uh, you, you get 25 questions. They're harder than the real test. They make them harder than the real test because if you can pass killer.sh, you can pass the real test. You get 120 minutes. So when the 120 minutes is up in killer.sh, it doesn't end. It's just, uh, it's like a self timer. It's to let you know that, you know, if you're on question 15 out of 25, your two hours have passed, maybe you need to work a little faster um, when it comes to the real exam. And what they mean by 36 hour cluster is if you, at any point when you start this killer.sh exam, over the next 30 hours, you can keep coming back to that same exam session, that same cluster, and going over whatever you did, trying to get 100%, um, reviewing whatever you did. Now before you go out and buy killer.sh, don't. You'll get it for free or included when you buy your ex exam uh, certificate to, to go take the exam, right? So you're ready to take the exam, you go over to the Linux Foundation, you enroll, you sign in, you pay your $375. If you look down here on the page, they say, Here's everything that includes, right? So your exam's two hours, it's good for three years, 12 months eligibility. That means if you purchase this today, you have 12 months to take that exam. Uh, you get one free retake, uh, but at, down here they say it's an ex you get an exam similar, and it's killer.sh. So if you purchase killer.sh separately, and then go purchase the exam, you're paying for killer.sh again. So if you want four tries, go for it. So after two months of studying nonstop, listening to YouTube videos on my way to work while doing yard work, doing the Udemy course, doing all the practice questions, doing the mock exams, I did killer.sh twice. The first time I, I think I came out to like a 50%. I did it the second time, I think I got like a 90%. I 
I said, I'm ready to take the real exam. So what was that experience like? So if you go to the page where you purchase your exam, you come down to the exam detail section, there's a link called exam tips. You click it and it brings you to everything you need to prepare, everything you're allowed to do during the exam, everything you need, like your ID, the normal stuff. So you can't touch your face, you can't whisper, you, you know, you can't take pictures, obviously. Nobody can be in the room. Um, technical instructions, like the cellular like root privilege can be obtained using this. Uh, rebooting is permitted. All that good stuff, right? Um, what I didn't expect is when it came time for me to show my desk, they wanted me to remove my speakers. And to give you an idea, these are Klipsch speakers. They're pretty big. They're wired into a subwoofer underneath the desk, wires going everywhere. Um, so that, that took me about 10 minutes to clean up. And then we started the exam. So the first thing you should do once you get in the exam, you're allowed to have one extra tab open. So what should you do with that extra tab? Well, you're allowed to go to these three links right here. You're not allowed to go to discuss.kubernetes. So what you should do is you should open kubernetes.io slash docs, right, in your one extra tab. And the first thing, first thing you should do is you need to know what version of Kubernetes cluster that you're examining on, that you're taking your exam on, right? So if you do like a, do like a kubelet uh, dash version, dash dash version, kubelet version, kubeadm version, right? Uh, whatever version you're taking the exam on, you need to make sure you go up to your right hand corner and click that version. Make sure you're on the right documents because they do differ from version. So when you're, you want to be careful as well, because when you're searching through the documentation, right? Maybe you've got something, I don't, you want to know how to do something with FCD, right? The key value store for the cluster. Um, just to give you an example, if you type FCD discuss, um, sometimes when you type etcd, whatever you're trying to do, you might get this link here called Discuss Kubernetes. You don't want that. Do not click on that. Do not click any links that have a path Discuss Kubernetes because you're not allowed to go there and you could potentially be failed for going there. You want to make sure everything you're going to is Kubernetes docs, Kubernetes, uh, let's say, where's it, blog, Kubernetes blog or the official GitHub for Kubernetes. So once you've got the documentation pulled up, one of the first things you're also gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna look for the cheat sheet. And don't worry, it's not cheating. It's called the kubectl cheat sheet. It goes to Kubernetes docs, and it's hands down the single most important helpful document that you're gonna use throughout your entire exam, right? So the first thing you're gonna wanna look at is they've got this alias section here. So it tells you how to create an alias in Linux for kubectl. And the reason you do this is because in your exam, tab is disabled. So normally in Linux, you would begin typing a path or you would begin typing a command and you hit tab and it would finish it for you. That is disabled during your exam. So to save a couple extra minutes on your exam, right? Instead of having a, you're gonna be typing kubectl a lot. I mean a lot. So to save you some time, you create an alias for kubectl of the letter K. So instead of typing out kubectl create, kubectl get, kubectl apply, you just type k, create, k get, k apply. And it saves you, you know, it all adds up over, you know, those few seconds of typing all add up to a few saved minutes during the exam, which could be, you know, for some people that that could be the, the difference between passing and failing. And there's tons of other helpful, helpful commands in here. I just encourage you, you know, if you're stuck on any part of the exam, you have a question, if you're maybe told to look for some specific information on a sp specific resource, look through here. You may find the command you're looking for uh, for that question. And then I would say the third and final most important thing you should pay attention to before you start the exam before every question is the fact that they tell you right here in the exam tip section that each task must be completed on a designated cluster or configuration context. So there's six clusters uh, in your exam environment, right? Different contexts. And they say at the start of each task, you'll be provided with the command to ensure you are on the correct cluster to complete the correct task. Well, they, so when you get in the exam, you'll see Make sure you copy and paste this command to make sure you're in the right context for the right cluster. 
because if you don't, you might do, you might get the question right. You might do exactly what they're asking for. You spend 15 minutes on it, but you did it on the wrong cluster, on the wrong context, and it, it, you got a zero on that question because you didn't do it on the right cluster. So please pay attention to that before every question, copy and paste that, uh, you know, set context on. Now let's talk about my personal exam experience. What was it like for me? How confident did I feel, right? How long did I take? Now the Linux Foundation's confidentiality agreement is a little weird and I find, and they're not, they're very vague on some of the stuff, right? So there's actually this line that says, um, you know, you are especially prohibited from disclosing, publishing, reproducing, transmitting any exam and related information, including to without limitation, questions, answers, worksheet. You know, don't, I can't give you guys the questions I got or the answers, obviously. But then there's this line here that says you cannot discuss the length or number of exam segments or questions. So that one's a little weird to me. Um, so I can't tell you how many questions I had, but to give you an idea, they say, you know, on their website, you will get anywhere from 15 to 20 questions. So. I took the entire two hours. I want to say I finished with 10 minutes left. Uh, I tried not to spend more than seven to 10 minutes per question. When I did hit maybe that 10 minute mark on one question, I just flagged it for later and skipped it. And then when I had my 10 remaining minutes left at the end, I went back and reviewed those questions I had skipped to see if I you know, could complete them the best of my ability. And overall, when I finished the exam, I was I was confident that I had passed. But you know, you always have that feeling: um, did I make it or did I not make it? Um, and then they say they have up to 36 hours to get your results to you, and they say they will not release your results um, for 24 hours. And they take that literally, right? So I think I, I finished my exam at like 6:30 p.m. I did not get my results until the next day at 6.30 p.m. on like the minute, the same minute I had ended that exam was the same minute, the next 24 hours later that I got my exam results and I had passed. So everyone that is looking to take the Certified Kubernetes Administrator exam, I hope this review helps you. I hope my experience uh, assists you. I hope you can use these resources. Your mileage may differ. Um, I did have some experience, you know, we started migrating to Kubernetes at work as soon as I started studying for this. So I did get a little bit of production experience on this. Not much more than you would get in the exam. You know, we stood up a cluster. We migrate some applications, uh, very basic. We're still in the, in the walking phases of that. Um, I do have experience, you know, working in like automation, infrastructure automation. Um, I've been a Linux administrator for a couple years now. Um, so I, I do have very good grasp on you know, networking concepts, DHCP, DNS. Um, I'm very comfortable in the Linux command line, bash scripting, Python, um, all that kind of good stuff, uh, containerization. So um, I didn't need to study as much as someone who's brand new to the subject matter might. Um, but I have seen a Reddit post where a user went from not knowing any you know, Linux containers or anything um, he went from knowing nothing to taking all three of the Kubernetes uh, exams, I think. I think he did it in like, was it 30 or 60 days or something? I don't know, just Google how I passed all three Kubernetes exams, uh, Reddit, and I'm sure you'll find it. Um, but I hope to see you guys in the next video.